You never get a second chance to make a first impression. Hey there, Booksy. Welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to share with you some of my first impressions from my reading in March. I'm always intrigued by a really great opening line and I'm always wondering whether the author is going to be able to deliver on what they promise on that first impression. Today I'm going to share five opening lines from books that I read in March. Opening lines that astounded me, that intrigued me, that piqued my curiosity and left me wanting more. The first of those books is Winter by Ali Smith and the opening line is God was dead to begin with and romance was dead, chivalry was dead. Poetry, the novel, painting, they were all dead. And art was dead. Theater and cinema were both dead. Literature was dead. The book was dead. And it goes on with all these artistic references and concepts that were all dead. And then she launches into why art is in life and not dead like the book says. In this one, Ellis Smith played with the connectivity of a novel. She didn't write complete thoughts. She gave suggestions and allowed the reader to fill in ideas. She introduced concepts, introduced people, introduced relationships, and glossed over a lot of the details, allowing the reader to be a part of creating the story. I really enjoyed that aspect of her writing, but the thing that really drew me into this book was how she played with words, played with the ideas that while the reader is there constructing an idea of a story. She's also playing with homonyms and giving the reader an opportunity to have a reading adventure in this book. So the opening line was great, but the experience of reading this book was probably even better. Stay With Me by Ayobami Adebayo had this opening line. I must leave this city today and come to you. My bags are packed and the empty rooms remind me that I should have left a week ago. Most of my driver has slept at the security guard's post every night since last Friday waiting for me to wake him up at dawn so we can set out on time. But my bags still sit in the living room, gathering dust. <laughs> this one was a little ambiguous because it opens in the future. We know we're meeting one of the characters we think is a female, and we're introduced to her, so we know that she's probably the main character in the story. But we don't know why, we don't know how she connects with the rest of the story because she's away. It's clear that she's been away from the action for some time. We're not sure why, we're not sure for how long. We're not sure, just as she isn't sure, of what she's going to find when she returns home. So that was a pretty intriguing opener, but it didn't really give a lot of detail. However, the author did connect that. And while it flipped back to some pastime, this opener is a big reward when we get to the end of the story and we start to see how it all ties in with the rest of the plot. I like the ambiguity of interesting me in something, but without telling me why it's interesting. George Saunders' novel Lincoln and the Bardo is a ghost story. Most people know that even before they read the novel. We know it's about President Abraham Lincoln. And we know it takes place in a bardo, which is the Tibetan or Buddhist idea of purgatory. So we know that there's some death. We know that there is some idea of the afterlife. And we know that that happens. But because we know that the book is about President Lincoln, we're not sure if it's about him dying. We know that he was assassinated. And so we expect that Lincoln is going to be the main character and the first line is going to belong to him. So when we open this book and it says, on her wedding day, I was 46, she was 18, immediately our mind skips back to some history class or history text that we've read. And we're thinking, was Abraham Lincoln that much older than his wife? However, on her wedding day, I was 46, she was 18. That line does not belong to President Lincoln. It's actually said by one of the other characters in the Bardo, and it's about his experience and what is causing him to be in this Bardo. But it's interesting that George Saunders would have chosen to make the first line not to be about this man, this president, who's known for his great oration. Why start a book about him with someone else speaking? So that was intriguing. So here's the rest of that first paragraph. On our wedding day, I was 46, she was 18. Now I know what you're thinking. Older man, not thin, somewhat bald, lame in one leg, teeth of wood, exercises the marital prerogative, thereby mortifying the poor young, but that is false. And that's Lincoln and the Bardo by George Saunders. Of course, this first impression was intriguing. It promised an expose into male thought patterns and it delivered exactly that. Most of the characters that we meet in this novel are male. President Lincoln, his son Willie, most of the ghosts that occupy the Bardo. And it's interesting to see what these men think about life and relationships and the ties that bind. <laughs> So George Saunders in this one promised an epic novel about history, about time, about male thought patterns, and he delivered exactly that. 
first impression of this one there's going to be some male jockeying and it does happen so in this case the novel definitely lived up to its first impressions in 1981 Salman Rushdie published Midnight's Children it won the Booker Prize that year it also went on to win several anniversary awards and the first line of Midnight's Children starts off with I was born in the city of Bombay once upon a time that first impression makes you think that it's going to be about birth. It's about the birth of something or someone. And that's exactly what this book is about. It's about Indians who were born at the exact moment when India regained independence from British colonization and about the connection between the people and their country's history. And in this novel, Salman Rushdie, through his narrator Salim Sanai, explores the incarnation of a family going through the history of its patriarchs and using that to represent the history of a country. The rest of the paragraph goes like this. I was born in the city of Bombay, once upon a time. No, that won't do. There's no getting away from the date. I was born in Dr. Nalikar's nursing home on August 15, 1947. And the time? The time matters too. Well then, at night. No, it's important to be more on the stroke of midnight as a matter of fact. Clock hands joined palms in respectful greeting as I came. Oh, spell it out, spell it out. At the precise instant of India's arrival at independence, I tumbled forth into the world. There were gasps, and outside the window, fireworks and crowds. A few seconds later, my father broke his big toe, but his accident was a mere trifle when set beside what had befallen me in that benighted moment, because thanks to the occult tyrannies of those blanding, saluting clocks, I had been mysteriously handcuffed to history. My destinies indissolubly chained to those of my country. For the next three decades, there would be no escape. Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie. A lot of his intentions with the plot are actually revealed in that opening paragraph, but I won't spoil it for you. This is a book that everyone should read at least once, maybe twice. And finally, A Brief History of Seven Killings by Marlon James. And it opens with this line. Listen. <laughs> okay, I'll give you two lines. Listen. Dead people never stop talking. That is a journal type entry from one of the characters in this book, Sir R.T. Jennings, who is killed and he's one of the ghosts who's inhabiting this plot line as we read through this book. And while we meet him first, he doesn't return until much later in the book. The story, as you probably know, cycles around an attempt to assassinate Bob Marley around the time of the general elections in Jamaica, 1976. And Bob Marley's political affiliations were very controversial. The election season was a very polarizing time in Jamaican history. Two major political parties and their supporters often clashed. And Bob Marley, or as the book identifies him as the singer, trying to broker peace between these two warring groups and being suspected by supporters on both sides. So the attempt to kill him, we're not sure why, we're not sure which group is actually trying to do it. Even though we're reading from multiple perspectives and we know that there are people who definitely want to take him out, we don't know which one is eventually successful when the assassination attempt actually happens. So this was a very interesting read because we are immediately ushered into this idea of journal entries where people are telling you their thoughts. We're not sure how they relate to the actual story. We don't know how each person contributes to the eventual plot line. But it's always interesting to read from these male perspectives, these male journal entries. And so this first one, I'll read the rest of mm, the first paragraph or so. It's not written in exact paragraphs. So Sir Arthur Jennings, and it starts with the name of the person who's speaking, Sir Arthur Jennings says, listen, dead people never stop talking. Maybe because death is not death after all, just a detention after school. You know where you're coming from and you're always returning from it. You know where you're going, though you never seem to get there. And you're just dead, dead. It sounds final, but it's a word missing an ING. You come across men longer dead than you, walking all the time, though heading nowhere. You listen to them howl and hiss, because we're all spirits, or we think we're all spirits, but we're all just dead. I'll save the rest because the paragraph is really long. And while I don't necessarily recommend this book because the language is very difficult, the book includes a lot of Jamaican dialect and very derogatory language. So it is not a very easy book to read. It's not a very friendly book to read, but it is a very interesting story. And so pick it up at your own will, but let me know if you do. From the opening paragraph, we know there's gonna be a lot of discussion about life and death. And this book does deliver on that promise. So in that case, first impressions are definitely the lasting ones. And so that's it. Those are the five books that I read in March. It gave me the best first impressions. And they're some of the books that I rated the highest. So for me, in March, first 
impressions were great impressions leave me a comment down below let me know if you like this video give me a thumbs up subscribe if you haven't already and we'll talk in the comments let me know if you've read these books or if me talking about them today made you want to pick them up so we'll talk in the comments and until next time happy reading bye the saying goes, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. Hey there, Booktube. Welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to share with you 